Princeton, New Jersey, April 18, 1955. Albert Einstein, a celebrated physicist considered to be the father of modern physics, dies at the age of 76. While Einstein's wish is to be cremated, Princeton Hospital Chief Pathologist Thomas Harvey must first determine the cause of death. But with the body of Albert Einstein on the autopsy table, Harvey's interest is drawn to something else. He wanted to find out what made Albert Einstein tick. And he sees, wow, there's the source of it all, the brain. There was something about the brain that fascinated him, and with no small amount of effort, he cut the skull, removed the brain, perfused it with formaldehyde. And the next morning, the New York Times says that Thomas Harvey has preserved the brain for scientific study. Thomas Harvey believed that somewhere within Einstein's brain was the secret to his genius. So he persuaded Einstein's son, Hans Albert, to let him do a study of his father's brain. Hans Albert and Einstein's executor came down to speak to Harvey about it, and Harvey impressed upon him just the, the, the uniqueness and criticality of looking at Einstein's brain as a way of approaching how people of intellect and genius think. Harvey took more than a dozen photos of Einstein's brain, dissected it, and shaved off thin slices for microscopic study. But years passed, and Harvey never published any papers or scientific observations. He also never returned the brain, but rather stole it and kept it for himself, with no intention of ever giving it back. Once Thomas Harvey had the brain, he didn't let it out of his sight. He left his position as chief of pathology at Princeton Hospital. And he headed out to the Midwest, and he went into general practice. But the brain was always with him, stored in two large glass jars and in cardboard boxes. There's been a historical trend of examining the brains or the gray matter of geniuses to try and find out what makes them tick. For instance, the Brain Institute in Moscow has kept the brains of dictator Vladimir Lenin and around 200 Russian scientists on a dusty shelf for years, hoping that they may too one day unlock the secrets of genius. But there's a fine line between science and grave robbing. Harvey got a little bit greedier because not only did he swipe Einstein's brain, it was basically a memento for him to have on his shelf. You'd think that the next of kin might have something to say about it. Harvey segued from his job, which is determine the cause of death of a patient at Princeton Hospital. And he did that when he completed the autopsy. And at that point, all we know is that he didn't want to hand it over. And that's why he said, I keep Einstein's brain, I'm the pathologist, and I'm studying it. Boston, Massachusetts, March 2018. Necto, a biotechnology startup company, announces an audacious and controversial plan. Their vision, a groundbreaking technique that can take the data stored inside a human brain and transfer it into a computer. There are companies like Nectome that are attempting to preserve the brain and the mind. Our methods of analyzing the connections between neurons in the brain are getting really good. And so eventually be able to model the connections between all the neurons. And at that point, we'll have a better idea as to whether or not it's possible to upload a brain into the cloud. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. Uploading is the process of basically copying and encoding someone's mental life onto a computer. Advocates of uploading believe that that would really be a way for you to survive the death of your brain. 
And now people say, well, if I'm immortal and I'm living my life inside a computer, isn't that rather boring? No, because this mainframe computer will connect to a mechanical avatar that is superhuman in every way, and you will see through its eyes, you'll feel through its sense organs. So in other words, we will have a form of digital immortality. Digital immortality, the incredible notion that we might someday be able to live forever. But if the information inside our brains can be copied and transferred, like information onto a computer hard drive, does that mean it can keep and store everything? Like our personalities, perhaps? Or would something be lost in translation? There are two issues to consider here. First of all, why believe that a digital copy of you is capable of being conscious? The second issue is that it doesn't at all follow that that being would really be you, that you are the survivor rather than a digital copy. Consciousness is one of the most hard to define phenomena about the human brain, and it's also what separates us from all other species. It's this idea that we have internal reflection. Can we actually live on forever in a computer and still be able to preserve all our memories, all our friendships, all of the different things that we love? And I think that that's a very romantic notion for a lot of people, that they want to feel like there's a way to go on forever. But you can't separate the brain from the rest of your body. There are those who believe the human brain has more potential than even the brain itself can imagine, and that its true capabilities might be limitless. In some ways, we know more about the far reaches of the galaxy than we do about the human mind. Atlanta, Georgia, December 1992. 17-year-old Amy Tippins is having difficulty breathing. Suspecting that she has some form of pneumonia, she makes an appointment with her family doctor. But the actual diagnosis she receives is, in a word, shocking. My senior year of high school, I started developing what I thought was pneumonia, and then when they went in and do some further testing, they realized I didn't have a pneumonia. It was actually a tumor pushing on my diaphragm and making it much harder for me to breathe. And I was in full liver failure. They said she'll, you know, she needs to have a transplant or she'll hemorrhage to death. With time running out, Amy received her new liver and survived. But in the months following her transplant, she found herself exhibiting interests and abilities that were not only new to her, but also surprising. Not long after surgery, some things about myself and some of my traits had changed. But then a couple years on my transplant, I really started to love projects like replacing flooring on my own. I never saw flooring being put in. I never saw anything like that being done. What I discovered is it was actually fun to work with my hands. I just kind of go, huh, that's interesting. Of course, it isn't surprising that people who have had life-saving transplant operations often report experiencing a new outlook on life. But new interests? New personality traits? Is it possible that Amy Tippins was getting these from somewhere else? I knew my donor was a male. I knew he was 47 and that he had been killed in a car wreck in Columbus, Georgia. So I went to the library and I started looking up obituaries for that time. And I kind of backed into his obituary and backed in to figure out who he was. What I discovered is he was a police officer. He was 47 and his name was Mike. His sister told me that he did a lot of his own home renovation. He also liked to work with his hands. He liked to do projects. When I found out who my donor was, it made a lot more sense on why some things about myself and some of my traits had changed after transplant. Can transplanted organs really contain some part of the donor's identity? Conventional medicine believes the notion is far-fetched. So how do you explain what we just saw? Is our life experience encoded not just in our brain, but 
throughout our entire body? 